Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. I would like to um, continue talking about uh, potential energy. In this case, in a little bit more complicated case than in the previous lecture. Previous lecture was about the constant force acting on um, a, a, a single object. It was a force actually of gravity, which we consider to be constant as the object moves falls down to the ground. Now, in this case, I would like to consider a different scenario. Um, we are talking about a spring now. So the spring, let's say this is a neutral position of the spring. We will obviously attach some kind of an object M to its end. Now, the spring can be compressed or it can be stretched, right? Now, um, first of all, I, I would recommend you to, to go to dynamics section of this course and uh, refresh information about uh, what's, what's there about the springs. What's important is that we have the Hooke's law, which basically tells us that within certain limits, obviously, um, the force uh, which spring um, exerts exor uh, uh, on, onto object attached to it is uh, proportional to um, the displacement from the center, from the neutral position. So basically if we have displaced uh, from this position to let's say this position, we compressed uh, by the length L, then the force would be equal to minus KL. Now let me explain why minus. Well, it's because my displacement is uh, always in opposite direction to the force. If displacement is to the left, my force is acting to the right. If displacement is to the right, my force would be, if it's stretching, it will, uh, the force will be directed uh, uh, to the back. So always, the force is always directed towards the neutral position, which means that if L is negative, let's say this is my positive direction of the axis. So if L is negative, then the force will be positive. If L is positive, the force will be negative. And the K is um, a characteristic of a spring. It's called elasticity coefficient. So it's uh, specific for every spring, but it doesn't really depend on the object. It's only a spring characteristic. Well, this is the Hooke's law, which is experimental law, obviously, and uh, it, it, it's not always true. But within certain limits, let's say a very small deviation from the neutral, it works fine. So we are assuming <coughs> this ideal situation, ideal spring, which conforms the uh, Hooke's law. Now, what we will do is we will analyze how the potential and kinetic energy of this particular mass is changing after we have uh, uh, compressed um, the spring by the length L and let it go. Again, let it go in the same sense as, as in the previous section, pre previous lecture, when I was talking about raising the object above the ground and let it go. Basically, letting the gravity to really do some work. In this case, we are compressing the spring with uh, the mass attached to it and then let it go. So we are letting the spring act on its own without our interference. And obviously, there is some work which it will perform, and that's exactly what we are going to do. Now, <coughs> in that lecture, by the way, about uh, in the dynamics part of this course, about uh, the, uh, the Hooke's law, um, uh, I have also derived a formula for the work, uh, which is equal to KL squared over 2. So this is the work which I have to really spend against the force of the spring to compress it mm, by, by the distance L. 
um, we will return to this for uh, to this formula a little bit later it will be actually derived a little bit um, later in the lecture and uh, you will see what why, why it's it's there but right now I'm just quoting this as a, uh, as, as a known formula from another part of the course. It's from the dynamics and uh, about the work. Okay, now, being as it may, now let's just do the formal kind of mathematical approach to this particular problem. So what do we have? First of all, um, I will introduce a function s of t. This is uh, the position of the object relative to its neutral position. So when we compress the spring, s of t, t is time, s of t becomes negative. When it's stretching, it becomes positive. So let's just think about what happens with this spring. So let's say I compressed it by the length L and let it go. Well, first of all, if I compressed it by the length L, it means this particular moment my function at time zero after I compressed it that's the time zero is equal to minus L now the initial speed of the object is zero by the way this speed is first derivative of my function of the distance right speed is derivative of um, of the distance so th the first derivative and the point zero it's equal to zero that's what we know about this function s of t now let's just think about uh, qualitatively what what would happen as soon as I let it go my spring will start pushing the object back to its neutral position right which means that um, there is a certain force force which can be calculated based on this particular Hooke's law. So the force would be equal to minus k distance from the neutral position, right? So this is the force as a function of time. Now, my s of t is always negative during the first stage of this process, so my force would be positive, so it goes this way. With a positive force, I will have a positive acceleration, right? force divided by mass. Now acceleration, by the way, it happened to be the second derivative uh, of, the, uh, of the distance, right? The first derivative is the speed, the second derivative is uh, the acceleration. So acceleration is positive, so which means our object is moving faster and faster and faster. Great. That means that at the very end it has certain kinetic energy, right? Because the speed will increase to a certain degree. What happens next? Well, the spring at this point does not act at all because it's in a neutral position. However, our um, object has certain speed at this point, right? Now, what happens? Well, it will move forward it will start stretching the spring now as soon as we start stretching the spring now the spring will start acting in this case against the motion right because now s of t will be positive as soon as we go beyond this point so my force will be negative which means backward so it will slow down my uh, my object so gradually it will slow down to a point zero that's the maximum stretch we can achieve in this particular case. After this, the spring will pull it back because there is no inertia anymore, the speed is zero, right? So speed has been decreased to zero and then becomes negative because the force is negative. And it will go back and it will go back to the neutral position and the whole story will repeat again but in this direction. It will again compress it and then stretch it, compress it and stretch it and that process will uh, continue to infinity in ideal situation obviously in the real spring there are some 
uh, losses of energy because of the friction and stuff like this. We are not talking about this. So this is our, our analysis of the situation. So in the beginning, we do have certain potential energy because the force will start moving an object towards a neutral position. Then, when we don't have any more potential energy, because there is no spring force exhausted in this particular case, now we do, but we do have kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy will move the object to that place, to the end of this stretching thing. At the end, we don't have any more kinetic energy. It will be only potential, because if left alone, which, which we did, the force of the spring will start pulling it back. So it will convert again back to uh, kinetic energy at this point, and potential will be zero, then goes to a uh, compressed mode, and it will again, uh, it will uh, lose the kinetic energy and the potential is growing. So, again, my point is to calculate potential energy and kinetic energy at any given time and calculate the full mechanical energy, which is their sum, and basically show that it's really a constant. That's my plan. So, let's do it. Okay, so we don't need this anymore. This is an obvious thing. So we have assumed that we have compressed our spring by the length L, initial length L. That's why F of S of 0 is equal to L, and this is this. Okay, now, what can we say right now? Well, this is basically gives us a differential equation, right? Minus f of t is minus uh, k s of t divided by m is equal to s second derivative of t. What is this? Well, well back to calculus, this is a differential equation. And um, these differential equations I did consider in the Mass 14th uh, course, which I might recommend you basically to refresh if you want to. But, however, uh, I, I will just borrow the solution to this differential equation uh, wholesale, and the solution is basically as follows. Now, if we have an equation, something like x of t is equal to uh, minus k divided by m x of t, Right? Something like this we have. So x is a function instead of s. Now there is a general solution. x of t is equal to... General means it depends on the constants. You remember the differential equations are e equations which usually, if we don't have any initial conditions, give you the whole set of solutions. So this is a set of solutions. Now it's c1 times cosine uh, square root of k over m t plus c2 sine of square root of k over m t. This is a general solution to this equation. If you will have a second derivative of this, you will get this. No matter how c1 and c2 are. Now, what are c1 and c2? Well, that's what we will do. Since uh, s of 0 is equal to 0, now if we will put 0 here, this will be 0, this will be 1, and we will have only c1. So c1 is equal to minus L. Okay. Fine. Now, the second condition. If we will make um, the first derivative of this and substitute 0 at t, what we will have? It will be... Um, it will be minus... minus c1 square root of k over m sine of square root of k over m t plus c2 square root of k over m cosine of square root of k over m 
G. That's my first derivative. And if I will substitute 0, this will be 0, sine of 0 will be 0, that goes. Now this 0 will be 0, so cosine of 0 is 1. And I will have C2 square root of k over m is equal to 0, which means C2 is equal to 0. That gives us basically the expression for S of t. So let me just write it down. So based on this differential equation and this initial condition, I can write that S of t is equal to minus L cosine of square root of k over m t. So I know my function of distance from the neutral depending on time. Now at time t is equal to 0, I will have cosine of 0 which is 1 minus L. So this is my initial compression mode. And then it starts basically oscillating. That's how cosine is oscillating. So from minus L it will go to plus L um, and uh, basically what we have here is these as oscillation will have a period of uh, of what? Uh, 2 pi divided by this or 2 pi multiplied by m over k. I inverted it, right? Regular cosine has a period of 2 pi but if you will multiply it by some uh, factor this factor goes into denominator. That's why it's reversed here. So I have a period. So with this period, my mass at the edge at the edge of the of the spring will oscillate back and forth from minus L relative to neutral to plus L, from minus L to plus L, etc. etc. Okay, fine. Now we are ready to calculate the potential and kinetic energies of our uh, mass. So we don't need this anymore. So I have a little bit more real estate. Okay. So we know S of t, that's the distance from the neutral position. Now we can uh, obviously have the V of t. That's the speed. This is the first derivative, right? Derivative of cosine sine minus sine. With a minus it will be plus, so it will be L. Uh, then this will be new uh, inner uh, coefficient and sine of square root of k over m t. So that's my speed. Okay. So I have my distance as the function of time and speed as the function of time. Okay, fine. So next thing is let's define the potential energy um, of the mass in its compressed mode. So as soon as we compress to uh, distance to the position minus L, what is the potential energy at this particular point? Well, as I was saying, just let it go and see what happens, right? Well, the force of the spring will perform work. This work, which the force of the spring will perform, is actually a potential uh, energy which my object uh, has in this particular position, right? So let's see, what is this potential energy? Um, now, the work is usually uh, its force times the distance. Now, the force is variable. Um, now, in this particular case, what's easier is to use this expression for the force. Not as a function of time, which I can also have because S is function of time, but as a function of T. 
uh, of s of, of a distance. So in this particular case, my work is different on different uh, segment of of the way of the movement of this edge of the spring, right? But in a small area from s to s plus ds, my differential of the work is f of s times ds. So the force during which infinitesimal um, increment of the distance times the distance. That would be infinitesimal increment of the work. And if I would like to have a complete work, I will have to integrate it from point minus L, that's the maximum compression, to zero, back to zero, back to neutral position. So from this compressed position to a neutral position. And that would give me uh, my work, which is performed by the spring, right? Which is equal to integral of minus L to zero. F of S is minus K S D S. That's a simple thing. Integral of S, uh, indefinite integral is S square over two. So it's minus K S square over two from minus L to zero. If you substitute zero for S, it would be zero. And then it would be minus. This is the formula of Newton, Newton Leibniz formula for integration. So it would be uh, minus and minus, so it will be plus, and L should be equal to, S should be equal to L, it would be K L square over two. Because that's actually the same, obviously, work which we initially spent compressing. So whatever we, whatever energy we spent, or whatever work we performed by compressing the spring, the spring will actually perform returning back to a neutral position. So that's why the potential energy at the very end of this compression, at point minus L, is equal to the same work which we have spent. This is another kind of manifestation, manifestation of um, uh, conservation of energy. Energy and work, they are all together. They're all kind of the same thing. So this is my potential energy at the very, very edge. Now, fine. Now, let's see what would be my um, kinetic energy uh, in two opposite ends. On the uh, most compressed mode, well, that's where kinetic energy is equal to zero because the speed uh, is equal to zero. But let's calculate it at the neutral position when it has the maximum uh, speed. Okay, I have the period, right? So my period is from most compressed position to neutral to a stretch position, back to neutral and back to a compressed position. So that's my T, that's my period. So from the compressed position to neutral, that's T over 4, divided by 4, right? 1, 2, 1, 2. So this is just one quarter of the whole um, uh, period. So I have to calculate my kinetic energy as my kinetic energy at moment t divided by 4. That's the kinetic energy at the neutral position, right? Now, that's mv of t divided by 4 divided by square, right? So I know v. m divided by 2, v square, l square, k m sine square of square root of k over m t. Now t is this. So it's not just any t, it's t over 4. So it's uh, 
KL square over 2 sine square of square root of K over M. Now T over 4 is pi over 2 M over, uh, sorry, M over K. Right? K, M, M, K. So I have pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. And it's equal to K L square over 2. The same thing as potential energy at the moment of stretching. So whatever the potential energy at the moment of... Uh, uh, sorry, not stretching. The compression. Whatever the moment whatever the uh, potential energy at the moment of compression, maximum compression is, is the same as kinetic energy at the moment of passing through a neutral point when the speed is maximum, after that speed actually goes down. So, in this case, they are equal. And you might suspect that in between these two points, between the most compressed and the neutral position, uh, uh, the sum of these two remains constant, right? And that's what actually makes the same thing as before with, for instance, gravity, when the potential energy, as we are saying, is converted into kinetic energy. Potential goes down, kinetic goes up, but their sum is always the same. That's why we are saying that one is converted into another. So let's just do this final calculation and find out what exactly is a potential function as a function Potential energy is a function of time. Kinetic energy is uh, the function of time. We will add them together and we will see that at any time it's the same and should be exactly the same as this, right? So that's my last little thing. We know that if we s compress uh, by the length L, the potential energy is equal to work, which, which is performed to compress it. The same thing with stretching. <coughs> the potential energy, if we stretch by the length L, will be exactly the same thing. So we can definitely say that my potential energy as a function of time is equal to K s square of t divided by 2, where s is a displacement of the neutral point. Now, my kinetic energy as the function of time is equal to m v square of time divided by 2. And since we know s of t and l of t and, and V of T, we can calculate them both at any given time, right? So, at any given time, the potential energy is equal to uh, K L square over 2 cosine square of, right? And my kinetic energy is equal to m2 v square, which is l square k over m sine square of k over m t, which is equal to, let's just cancel m, and we will have k l square over 2 sine square co square root of this. And now it becomes obvious that as the time grows from zero, my cosine is decreasing from one down. So that makes the whole thing decreasing. Now this is a sign it's a sign. So as t is increasing, sine is increasing. So this is increasing. So my potential energy 
as the time goes by from zero to one quarter of the period to a neutral point my potential energy is decreasing my kinetic energy is increasing what about their sum well if you will sum this and this you will see that K L square over 2 uh, cosine square plus sine square which is 1 so we will have this constant which proves that <coughs> it's, it's a valid point actually to say that potential energy of the compressed spring is gradually converging into kinetic energy at the very neutral point where it's the maximum and then if we continue this, these are sine and cosine. Just believe me, if we will continue, we will get exactly the same story. The kinetic energy at the neutral point will uh, actually cause the spring to stretch. And at the very end, uh, the kinetic energy will be equal to zero because the speed will be equal to zero. But the potential energy will be exactly equal to exactly the same thing. It will stretch to the same exactly distance it was compressed before and that's how it will uh, uh, oscillate from minus l to plus l from minus l to plus l and the kinetic and, uh, uh, and potential energy together will always be equal to the same constant but they are this amount of energy is distributed among potential and kinetic uh, in in this particular fashion which basically proves again that full mechanical energy in these simple um, kind of situations is preserved the conser conservation of full mechanical energy is basically proven here um, okay that's it i suggest you to read the textual part for this lecture it's available on unisor.com um, so uh, I think it would be a very good idea if you will try to to calculate basically this potential energy as a function of time and kinetic energy as a function of time just by yourself. So do all these calculations without you know looking at my notes uh, to this lecture or without uh, listening again to a lecture. Try to do it yourself. That's a great exercise and you will have uh, this answer, I hope. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.